Welcome to another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. Today, we will talk about open innovation and life sciences. Um, and we have as guests, uh, Devini, Harini, and Joyce. Welcome to all three of you. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Hello. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Happy to be here. All right. So we will... So we, <laughs> You are basically some of the people behind the open innovation and life sciences community and organizing uh, a conference um, since, was it 2017, 2019? Okay, that's 2018. 2018, in between. Yes. Well, almost. Um, okay, so why why is that? And, and let's maybe hear from each of you, one after the other. Um, what brought you to the project? What's your research background? Why do you feel you want to engage in um, motivating other researchers in the life sciences to to adopt and um, implement open science practices and open innovation? What is open innovation in a life science context? So many questions. Okay, who wants to start? <laughs> Arini, um, do you want to? Let's have Joyce touch. She oh, can yeah, give Joyce, us also an oh, yeah. introduction oh, into how oil started. Yeah, she's, the, she's the leading lady she's of all of this. So, yes, exactly. <laughs> the leading lady, the, the brain of the organization. Uh, the we can go in chronological order. Let's say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the accidental co-founder. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no, oh, okay. Well, it's not, it's not that accidental. Um, right, so... Open Innovation in Life Sciences, the association, it's a, a nonprofit association, and um, it actually always wasn't always like that, and it was never intended to be like that necessarily. In 2017, I think, um, a group of us, us as in um, postdocs and PhD students at ETH uh, Zurich, Mm -hmm. um, wanted to organize a conference, essentially. Basically, we we, we all really wanted to organize a conference. And there was a uh, particular postdoc, his name is Christian Feller, um, that was wanted to bring together industry, society, and government. Um, and so we created kind of this open innovation and life sciences conference in 2018 uh, and invited like everyone mm -hmm. <laughs> um, to have a conversation about like how we can, you know, network together and work together and do open innovation, you know, between um, academia and industry and involve government officials as well in policy um, and, and, and such. Um, so that's, that's kind of how, how it kind of started. This event, the inaugural event was such a success <laughs> <laughs> that we're like, let's do it again. <laughs> Okay. Um, like just yeah. the next year. So it's it's every year. Just the next year. Huh. Exactly. Yeah. So so then we gathered all of the the knowledge that we got for for organizing this this inaugural conference, and then I tried to pass this on to another committee, and um, my co-founder was actually <laughs> in that committee, and uh, her name is uh, Tina Ambrosi, mm -hmm. and um. So she ran the second conference, right? And, you know, we, and planned all of that with a new committee. And then I think in the third year was when Tina and I kind of chatted about like after the conference was over, like, you know, this is what, 2019 now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right before Corona. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we essentially like came together. We're like, yeah, how was that experience for you? And we're like, yeah, this needs to be developed further before it can be passed down more and more. And so this is how kind of oils turned into a nonprofit association. So my co-founder Tina and I essentially put our heads together and then started building the organization from there. And then that's where Harini and Devmini kind of come in. So, oh, so, um, <laughs> so it's now a registered NGO in Switzerland. Is that so? Or as part of Zurich ETH. So in Switzerland, there is a construct called a Verein, um, yeah. like an association, mm -hmm. and uh -huh. um, that is what oils is rep is 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 registered under or is is identified under. Mm. So, and Swiss laws make it actually quite easy to establish a Verein. Okay, <laughs> uh, you also yeah. need a board and like uh regular meetings and all of that, so it has a little bit of an administrative overhead. Yes, uh, so there is an advisory board, 
maybe Karini, Devmini, I mean, you guys are preparing for the next advisory board meeting, right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. that when you can start off okay. with how you entered. Or okay, else. yeah, I can I can start off with how I got involved. So yes, I think so. I, I got involved with the conference organization first. I think it was in 2019 that I joined, end of 2019, to organize the 2020 conference uh, mm -hmm. with um, Joyce and Tina as the people leading uh, this whole uh, event. And um, yeah, I was there for the organization. I was part of organizing this uh, a workshop called Life Work Balance. And then I remember uh, Joyce and Tina asking everybody, we're trying to establish oils as an official for I'm in Switzerland. Does anyone want to get involved with this? So I think, and then I wrote to Joyce. I was like, yeah, yeah, I will be interested in, you know, being a part of this, seeing what you have to do and so on. Me and another girl, Teresa, we joined in on this. And then, yeah, it was um, basically paperwork that you had to do to, mm. to actually establish uh, the statutes and so on. And I basically didn't have any idea how this is going to is gonna go. So I was kind of trying to help, but also kind of spectator. As a, I was there as a spectator as well. And um, yeah, so that's how I got involved. And I, so... Joyce and Gina were the program and operations directors. And then me and uh, Teresa, we were the associate directors at first. And then we tried to get more people to join the association and um, yeah, and organize other things um, apart from the conference mm -hmm. um, to run the whole year. So yeah, in 2020, we started expanding beyond just yeah. the conference. Was that maybe because can go. it was difficult or basically impossible due to COVID to organize an on-site conference that you diverted into other formats or? Exactly, yeah. Uh, mean, well, no, 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 wait, hold on. The conference still went forward, but it was online, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think because we learned, format. yeah, but I think it was always intended that oils be, be growing would be growing beyond just an annual conference. Mm -hmm, so to yeah. offer more, more, um, I guess, offerings, services <laughs> beyond mm. just a once, once opportunities, opportunities. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> beyond just once a year. I think the idea was like, you know, open science and the topics of open innovation, open science should not be talked about just one time a year, yeah. but we should actually be doing this more often. Mm -hmm. yeah. Therefore, we should be doing public discussions more often. We should be doing like organizing workshops and courses more often. So it's not just that once a year we all come together and talk about open science. It should be mm. year round. Yeah. Okay. I actually came in in 2020. So I started my PhD in a rather special situation. Let's say I started at the onset of COVID. Mm. So I was new to Zurich. I was um, working from home a lot. I didn't have a connection to the Zurich Scientific Network. And I happened to chance upon this email that was circulated from the PhD program that said, hey, you know, we're looking for organizers. And I signed up. And actually, as they were describing the process of how OILS was set up, I must say when I joined the first meeting from OILS to introduce the organizing committee to what the responsibilities would be, if you asked me then, I would have not known that OILS was just a year old or badly. Mm -hmm. To me, oil seemed like a very well-running oiled machinery that had, you know, its roots in the <laughs> ground for a while, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so then that's how I came on board. I came on board as a part of the 2021 organizing committee, mm -hmm. um, where then that year we organized it as a hybrid event. I think it was the second year that all of the talks and all of the workshops, panel discussions, keynotes were all online over Zoom. Mm -hmm. And then we had a reception, an apero, as they call it in Switzerland, um, on site so that people who were in the network could still meet because by then the the restrictions on meeting were removed so we could meet in mm. person in small numbers um so we were able to have something on site and this year we also like Joyce mentioned started having more events so we also in addition to the annual conference which was kind of our key key event we also had like smaller panel discussions um that were taking place that year and with covid being the topic i think one of the panel discussions that year was focused also on covid and how mm. we can contribute to the science then right Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of how I came on board. Um, so I started out as an organizing committee. Then I also took decided to stay on in the association, 
which I thought at that point was already like several years in the run making. <laughs> so I stayed on as marketing uh, in the marketing and then I now function as the operations director with Dave Mini, who didn't mention it, but she's oh, now yeah, the program yeah. director. <laughs> Just yeah. so you know. So this is kind of, yeah, like Joyce says, a meeting of the old and new guard when we talk about oils in this podcast. Yeah. Nice. Wow. Okay. Sounds really impressive. Um. So why I was also digging and asking, so why did you register this? Because most scholarly initiated or um organ no, initiatives that are born out of curiosity and need and gap filling by young researchers or like researchers tend to remain independent or what is this un unregistered initiatives for some time. What made you think, I think I go back to Joyce, what made you and Tina um, think that it's better to register it as an association in Switzerland too? Um, so uh, first of all, um, registering in Switzerland as a Verein, you don't, uh, as a Verein in Switzerland, there's no like really registration, registration. You mm. are a Verein um, when you write your statutes and you held your first general assembly. Mm -hmm. And with those documents, um, you can essentially be a, a legal entity. Um, and one of one of the main drivers, <laughs> um, this is going to sound a little bit, uh, yeah, maybe not as inspiring, but <laughs> uh, one of the main drivers of why we had to do this um, and why we really needed to move forward with this was actually because of finances. Yeah. So originally we were um, nested under this great um, uh, community network called um, Life Science Zurich. Mm -hmm. um, so we were running underneath this kind of bigger um, network that was a joint venture between the University of Zurich and ETH Zurich to kind of uh, network their life science communities together, mm -hmm. right? Um, but uh, OILS as an association, we were doing a lot of our own independent fundraising um, and also uh, from, from writing grants to also um, uh, asking for uh, uh, corporate sponsors. Um, and at some point, uh, it became really difficult to continue uh, managing our money through Life Science Zurich. So we ended up establishing as a Verein so we could have our own bank account and to um, be independent, um, mm -hmm. which makes things run somewhat smoother, at least in the background, administratively. Yeah. yeah. That, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. And yeah. also to, to be fair... We, we we still today, I think, collaborate quite a lot with Life Science Zurich, and they're still kind of like our umbrella, <laughs> um, yeah. but, but administratively, yeah, we're in, we're independent. Okay, well, that's... Um, we have a board member from Life Science Zurich as well, so I think we work quite closely with them. They're very, very helpful. Uh, mm. Yeah. Stuff, yeah. Right, and that, but then to have um, a registered organization also... Well, it's always useful. So you yeah, have dedicated and committed people who commit for a certain time to, or for a term until the next election. And then you can be sure that the work is going to be done within that time. So in running events beyond the annual conference, how do you keep those manageable? Because each of you is also still doing your own research, right? And engaging in all kinds of other activities outside oils. How's that going? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, no, I'm asking out of my own experience. Yeah. And happy to also share mine. Like, how do you manage multiple? Yeah. I, I think the biggest thing, at least for me, was that when I joined OILS, it was purely out of curiosity to see what's going on. I never organized a conference before. So this is kind of my main drive for joining. And then I stayed on because I really liked the experience. I liked the people and I liked, I like the whole experience of working on yeah. this conference together. I was like, okay, what's it like to actually establish an association and what does it take to run something? And then you kind of start to learn about open science that, oh, actually, I like this idea a lot. I, I can get behind this. Mm -hmm. And this why I stayed. And I think it's out of my own interest. So I think if I had to do this, if somebody told me to do this, that I had to do something not out of my interest, it would be very difficult to manage things. So because I really want to be a part of this, I 
manage my time accordingly. Um, yeah, I, I think you kind of get better at managing everything as well with your PhD plus everything else because mm-hmm. you have to. So I, I think I, I've done all right so far. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I mean I, you graduated and defended I graduated, really yes, well. I so <laughs> I've been on the last year, so I, I think I think things went things went all right. <laughs> yeah, it's not a trick question. So I'm just really asking. <laughs> no, no, no. no but I, if I, I could. Like, yeah. If I could also add to what Devani yeah. said, right? I mean, of course, we're here because we like to do things outside the PhD mm-hmm. that bring us some, like that we're interested in. But in addition to it, oils also is a lot more than just the three of us on this call, right? We yeah. have other members in the committee. Uh, we have a dedicated conference committee, so they kind of run the show. And then other association members take care of the other events. So we have associate directors who kind of lead other projects. So um, if we say we want to organize a panel discussion, which in fact we have one coming up soon, then we kind of delegate tasks among ourselves. So there's yeah. plenty of us, plenty of hands on board per mm-hmm. se. Let's say so that it's not too much on one person's mm-hmm. plate alone. Mm-hmm. And also it's um there are times where some people get a bit too busy and they cannot contribute as much so i think i think we try to communicate this um as as early as we can so that we say oh we we're not we're not going to be around so much because i'm writing my thesis i don't have that much time so i won't be around but i will come back after this so that yeah. the work is then kind of distributed to other people maybe stuff that you kind of took on but i'll realize i can't do all of this at the moment then you try to kind of delegate those or ask hey who who can take over this because I really can't seem to manage all of this at the moment so Mm -hmm. and people are some depending on everybody's time happy to take on some tasks or Mm -hmm. you try to do some stuff yourself as well so yeah Yeah. and Joyce for you so you've been you've been funding this you've been um running arts since the start do you feel you want to stick around a little longer <laughs> sounds sounds detached so obviously you are you are very committed to to the association it's, it's like uh... actually, actually surprise surprise um i no longer really work in the association oh. <laughs> 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 um i actually what are what are the things that um i say i moved to germany in 2021 right mm-hmm. yeah from Zurich, yeah, end of really? 2021. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's been and, a year. Uh, that's, oh my god. Yeah, and that's when I passed on my position mm-hmm. to Dev Mini. Um, yeah, and it was kind of interesting to see if everything that Tina and I and Dev Mini and Hermini have built mm. would go on without the fun founders, co-founders. Yeah. And I would say that it has. <laughs> oh, and... <laughs> so. <Yeah. laughs> and how does that make Objective. you feel? <laughs> it's kind of surreal to me that, like, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's working mm-hmm. without me. And but this is always intended, right? Like to think yeah. about how to build things sustainably, right? I think this is a a point that a lot of academic initiatives struggle with, but um, mm-hmm. it's still running. And it's still running well. <laughs> I would say maybe yes. even, I was, I would even, say so, yes. maybe I, even I mean, we're trying even, <laughs> even better than before. <laughs> um, and so, really, my role in all of this is uh, currently is um I, I kind of lurk on the Slack. Why do you opportunities to them to support? Like, oh, I can have us. <laughs> I know. I feel like Joyce is now this omnipotent entity kind of hovering over everything. No, no, no. In a, no, not, no. In a, not in a bad way, but you know, she's she's always looking over you like a fairy godmother. Okay, there, there we go. <laughs> Thanks. No, no. I mean, it's just sometimes the, the people have questions, and I guess I'm in a kind of a more mentorship roles where where if they're really really stuck with something. I mean, uh, at least uh, the directors and oils like know like, okay, we can ask Joyce or the previous people who've been, not just me, right? I mean, there's Mm -hmm. also Tina, there's also other people who have been through the association. And um, I guess we've built a community that extends beyond just the Slack community where people Mm -hmm. feel comfortable to just ask, right? Like, Mm -hmm. hey, you know, 
you ran this or where's the documentation for that or something and people are happy to help out so mentioning documentation and that's already uh, a trigger the mini and the arenas and you probably well you were there as the groundwork was laid out but what what made it easy to continue without joyce and tina so what, what do you think was essential in allowing you to just, you know, take over and, and continue? I think everything, actually that, was when... in, yeah. everything that was done in the previous years is all on, we have our Google Drive, so everything, everything to the tiniest detail is there. So mm -hmm. we can always go back and look at what's been done before. And Joyce and Tina also wrote a wiki to basically how do you run the organization, the uh, conference, and all of these things. So there's like an entire guideline of things that you can follow. So there's no, uh, thankfully, everything's been documented, all the past events, everything, and we try to keep this up. So every time we organize something new, we make sure to put all the details of every email we write or everything, all drafts and everything like that on the Google Drive. So, hmm. yeah. So and one of the reasons why I said that when I joined, it sounded, it seemed like a organized association that's been mm -hmm. around for a while was precisely this reason, right? This was a year after it was registered an association, let's say per se. Mm -hmm. um, and even then they already had all of the material from the previous conferences, like they've mm -hmm. mentioned and a very detailed wiki for the conference and for the workshops and panel discussions. And the idea with the wiki, I think when Joyce and Tina set it up was also that with any upcoming or a new event that we want to host, we are still able to, or we know we should be adding this to the wiki and keeping it ready for the next set of people to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to contribute. So they don't, are they not like, you know, starting from scratch because that makes no sense considering how much work has been done towards mm -hmm. setting up these uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And, and Joyce, so, I mean, I, I personally am also running organizations and for some, well, for one, it was obvious that we need this documentation, um, but like, honestly, for me, I'm not the most organized character, I have to admit, maybe also because I have an entrepreneur and researcher mindset, which I like to explore, but documentation is not my strong foot, really. But um, but I'm very well aware that it helps <laughs> to, to for, for the exact reasons that you just mentioned. Um, to avoid repetition, to avoid having to reinvent the wheel that's already there like 10 times. <laughs> and yeah, and especially so to allow others to smoothly take over and, and seamlessly join and, and um, join the team and find a position within. So why, why, why did you, um, why did you, set this up so early in the process. I'm I'm asking with a little bit of an env envious or respectfully, no, what's the word? Like ad admiration. <laughs> like, like because I feel so, like I should have I could have done this sooner if I and also I feel like I'd like who has the time for documentation. I think this is also a dilemma in research. Um to take the time to properly document to make your own life easier, but also that of your team colleagues. So I think there's also some parallels here to the research process, but yeah, back to oils. So when, when was clear to you we have to document this properly to make it survive? I think it's it was like an evolution of things, right? Okay. So um, it actually came from uh, came from doing research, right? So so uh, I have a PhD in computational biology and bioinformatics. I've done a postdoc at New York University. Mm -hmm. And during that postdoc, I had to do like a massive experiment uh, where we had to do like 400 gene knockouts <laughs> in, within <laughs> one year. Wow. Oh. Um, it's like that... more than one per day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, it was, we we're working with 400 fly lines and then yeah. we we're essentially knocking out two no, no, 200 fly lines knocking out two genes. Yeah, um, <laughs> it starts on day one and then one knockout after the other, but just, so, just from yeah, yeah. what you're talking about, it's quite quite a high throughput. It, yeah, <laughs> when, I, <laughs> when I first presented what we were doing at conferences, there was like an audible gasp in the <laughs> audience. <laughs> but the thing is, <laughs> well, it, well, before before I go on into too much of a tangent, but um, yeah, uh, 
um <laughs> to, in order to, in order to do something like that you have to be extremely organized and yeah. i was lucky enough to to be in a lab where um i mean i, I was in the lab of mark siegel at new york university mm-hmm. and um Actually, I learned a lot from him and a lot just working within the group there on how to just really organize people and things and documentation (laughs) so that, you know, things you minimize like what can go wrong. And then when things do go wrong, you have like a backup plan in place, right? Because we were on a really tight deadline, like funding is only good for so long, right? And so you had to finish the knockouts by this deadline and then move forward with the project, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, so that's kind of I guess the origins of where I became like maybe organized to uh, Mm -hmm. oh yeah a bigger degree than most people I guess (laughs) yeah Um, yeah yeah, so that's kind of where it started and then and then when I moved to Switzerland um, I did a lot of startup training there. I got into the startup community and the entrepreneur stuff and had a few failed startups and partially the failure was like maybe a lack of organization. So it's kind of like oils was maybe my third or fourth try at, at establishing something okay. um, before I really got it right, I hope. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we settled on that. It's quite a success. <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> yeah we we see how long how much longer it's running <laughs> hopefully um, for a while no? hopefully, yeah, yeah, well, hopefully yeah, forever yeah. right yeah we're, we're all about sustainability here mm-hmm. but yeah so so that's that's kind of how how it how it started and where it came and also i i I want to, you know, also give props to to my co-founder tina who is also a very very organized person oh, okay. um so, so what well, the whole documentation in the startup world or in the corporate world, I think people call it a process manual or uh, yeah, I think that or step of, of building a product. So we are talking about documenting what SLPs? We document the process manual of okay, so in the industry they call these process manuals or company manual or something like that, where where it helps, yeah, to it just helps the organization keep going and to onboard new team members quickly and to also as reference documents for the present team members for whenever it's going something's going unexpected ways. Or just to reassure ourselves that this is how this is the process basically for us. And sometimes maybe also documenting why that's a good process because other things have been tried and don't seem to work for a particular community, something that's specific, or other things that are applicable more broadly. Okay, so that's that's great. And that's very yeah, as as we said before, it's also important in research per se, but also running an organization. And you might think that a research project is an organization in itself, with People, researchers coming together from different angles for a specific time, um, several months or years, working on the same project. So now I would like to, for us, if, if you agree, can we move towards the open innovation aspects? Because I feel like, um, or maybe also like the connection between open science and open innovation, because for me, there's so much research output being produced as in research articles from across disciplines and especially um, much in the life sciences. So how can we make sure that the research outcomes find implementation and application in the real world outside the ivory tower, outside academia? And to what degree do you think is it a researcher's responsibility to ensure that that can actually happen? Or what's the environment that you think is needed to make that happen? Is there enough trigger questions? Some big ones. Can, but... I, can, I, can I start with this? Because I have a lot of opinions on this. <laughs> this is, no, sorry. Because this is, because it, it comes up, for, at least with me, with the, a colleague of mine. We we're talking about how research academia works in general, right? I mean, academia and industry, are, I feel, um, far, you know, sides of the same coin. And um, 
like you said, a lot of the academic research is focused on publishing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of nice, great information and everything, but you publish and then you just leave it. But how do you implement that to be actually useful to society and some okay this is interesting information it could be used in some way to I don't know to form a product or from a service or anything um in 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 um, yeah that that would help a patient or something like this mm. but it doesn't go there so uh, and then comes the entrepreneurs that are you know kind of reading everything and trying to put something together but often this doesn't happen so much in life sciences I feel because it's somebody who's they think oh I have a nice project that works I'm gonna try to build a startup on this at least this is what I see happening mm. and to answer your question how do you how do you how do you make sure that everything or not everything at least the useful things that come out of research that could be developed for they actually end up in a uh, I don't know uh, in in a place where people can actually use it um yeah I, I'm not quite sure I think this is there's a lot of like startup um um courses and stuff going on introduced to students PhD students I think it's a culture change that needs to happen mm. at least in uh, academia I mean my opinion I, I think a lot of the PhD students you meet they, they're so focused on their career as a PhD student going to a postdoc becoming a professor that they don't think oh actually I can do something else with this as well this you at least I don't see it so much in in my surrounding. Mm, thank you. And Arine, what's your perception? Um, I mean, maybe I come in from a different perspective, right? In the sense, for instance, now a lot of projects generate a lot of data. I mean, people now are working at the at the big data level, let's say, right? I mean, mm. they are not, no longer are we only generating qPCR data. Now we're generating big omic data. And when it comes to this data, I think open innovation can play a part in the sense if these data are submitted to public repositories and they are accessible, right? Projects can be built off of it. And a good example, although maybe an overkill, but nonetheless, a good example of this, I would say, is the Cancer Genome Atlas, so the TCGA. So for people who work in the cancer field, maybe they know, already, know of this already. A lot of projects are based off of this data. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a small but a good example of I would what I could still, what fits into the concept of open innovation, maybe, but not perceived like so, is the availability of such large data sets that allow for different types of answers and questions to be asked and answers to be explored. Because I think a good part of open innovation is accessibility to existing information so that there is not a reproduction of the same kind mm. of data and resources invested into reproducing the same data, right? Because after crossing the peer review stage, at this point, you trust the data. You should be able to, you shouldn't need to go back and reproduce the same data. That's the point of peer mm -hmm. review to get it thus far. Um, so I think open innovation in that, in that context, I think a lot of us are already doing a lot in this space without realizing that we are working in what we in what, let's say, in a big jargon can be called open innovation. So any project, I would say that even small ones that stem from the TCGA data set could still fit very well into the scope of what open innovation can be. And if I come back to your second question or like one of the triggers that you had was, how can we as scientists and researchers kind of see if our data and our research actually goes into the translation phase or the market? I mean, I guess this really depends on what kind of research you do, right? A lot of times the basic research maybe does not have so much of a uh, a value in translation, especially in the life sciences, but it goes into building what would then reach the clinical stage and what would then be a part of clinical research and translational research. Mm. So I think as long as people are open to building up from data that is available and not are not keen on always generating new data if there is existing data, of course, new data is important, but if you can work with public data, and that's the point of it, I suppose, um, especially in labs that are low on resources, I think it's already a step towards innovation, open innovation, let's say. Mm. Because you're like, you're, 
you are in both worlds, so to say, right? You've done research and you're also an entrepreneur. And on the is it on the industry side of things? So what what like from seeing both angles, what would you say on these questions? Like what ah. what's needed to enable um the knowledge transfer or the translation of knowledge from academic output to implementation on the on the corporate world. So so the entrepreneurship side and the industry side, I've always been looking at it from actually an academic perspective. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> How does that look like? So right. There. What do you see there? Um, well, <laughs> what do I see there? And and I, <laughs> well, in my current role right now as a senior project manager at a, at a university hospital, and I kind of sit between... Well, I interact with a lot of different stakeholders from industry and also from um, academia. And um, yeah, what do I see there? <laughs> I see that um, it's it's really interesting to see how they try to reconcile different objectives, right? In mm -hmm. academia, there are certain objectives that they want to achieve. Uh, mostly it's um, like a publish or perish kind of attitude, right? Um, they don't necessarily have to think too much. Um, yeah, about about like getting getting funded next or anything mm. like that, right? But revenues and, and and the the bottom line and things like that, which is what um, a lot of like a uh, corporate or industry partners are more concerned with. So this is I feel like where a lot of kind of people butt heads in these kind of um, projects where there are multiple partners <laughs> um, involved. Yeah. Okay, How that's so, resolved, I don't yeah. <laughs> really know. <laughs> but also um, like the mon but, monetary uh, yeah, aspect as... aside for an, for an academic researcher, the primary goal is to acquire knowledge to then present it in writing. And then other researchers build on that, as well as potentially industry people can take that knowledge and build products from it, right? So I do, like theoretically, it looks like a straightforward process. But I think what's um what's often missing and what's also becoming increasingly sensitized on the researcher side is to like on the scientific writing part to describe the research outputs in a way that non-academics can understand to start with <laughs> and um, to provide lay summaries or to write the whole research article with not too many acronyms and if you use them the acronyms should be explained like less technical technically more yeah descriptive I mean the whole thing is a description but yeah to to also put a narrative I, I... It's more widely ex ex applicable like to a wider audience except your own niche researcher community. Well. Um, so I, I think where things actually get kind of head, head buddy <laughs> mm -hmm. is actually when it comes to intellectual property. It, I think it's oh, yeah. less about the documentation because like companies, companies also hire scientists. I mean, yeah. we, they were all previous academics, <laughs> like well, the PhD level, right? Which a okay. lot of times are, are, are yeah. So they, they they can understand the science, they can understand the jargon. That's not necessarily the issue, I think. Because um, depending on who you deal with in industry, I think the issue comes where when people um, start talking about intellectual property, right? Because there are laws and regulations around this that um, directly go against the kind of this, um, you know, the academics are like, oh, you know, let's publish this. We need to publish this ASAP, but this is actually not great. Or we need to present this at a conference ASAP. But if you look at like patent law, for example, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's not great. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> you actually you can't. can't. A, yeah. Exa yeah. Yeah. You can't get a patent if you publish your, whatever it is, methodology or whatever product that you want to, um, or whatever you can't get a patent on it and so you I, can't okay I, I, i'm not a, a bit patent, yeah. public knowledge right but as so. isn't it all about the license because the patents themselves are publicly like readable but they are protected by a, oh sure right so you can read uh, you... Yeah? so 
<laughs> I'm not an expert on this, but I, I mean, the, the basics are that if it becomes public knowledge, yeah. you cannot patent it. Yeah. So companies really want you to slow down. Okay. Well, I'm just applying companies generally, mm. but essentially there are things that need to be done. Um, and you cannot publish as fast as you need to in academia. So there's kind of this butting of heads um, mm. of like different goals and objectives here. Right. Because um, in academia, you need to publish like fast, right? You need to publish ASAP because um, what your where your revenue comes in is essentially grants, mm. right? And you don't get grants without publications. And so their interest there is to publish really, really fast. Whereas um, for private companies, like they're going after the patents, but in order to do the patents, you can't really make this known out in public or you won't be able to get the patent to generate the revenue you need for mm. the companies, right? So, yeah. But it doesn't necessarily contradict with open science because if you look at the details and again how we started, like um if or did we have this on record? Maybe not. But the like the term open science may be or I think in my observation is quite misleading. Um when we define open science as opening up to society, including the um the corporate world. But that doesn't necessarily mean that everything has to be open and publicly accessible, but it needs to be documented well and structured and with metadata, meaning descriptions and contextualization. And then you can publish it closed access, also in repositories where you either put an embargo period of up to several years or however long you need, but it's documented and the, there's also, also uh, accountability because the researchers put their name to the product, the article or the data set. And then, yeah, it can be inquired. And also the patent authorities can see, okay, here's the timestamp, the attribution. Um, and from that, I don't know, I'm not sure if that um, complies with the patent um, legal requirements, but I would guess it, it can then serve both the open science idea and principles, as well as yeah, allowing for patents to be written and and um, enacted. And what I've also learned also only recently is that patents actually are, but well, they have a very good intention. And I think it's like, it seems, well, it is restrictive and as in who can use the product or sell the product on the market. But especially when we think about sensitive um, products where we're not sure on the research level, can this be misappropriated or misused in any way and turned against society or community, then the originators or the developers of their product have 20 years time to test the product to an extent to troubleshoot and do a proper risk analysis. So that's one aspect where they actually make a lot of sense. I mean, you could argue if it really has to be 20 years, can it not be sooner? <laughs> like now that we are running I, full speed into climate change and all of these things, but, um, and I, also a lot more. where the problem comes in, right? Hey, sorry? Sorry, I, sorry. I, I was saying that this is where the problem lies, right? Because it, it's that long, I guess, you know, yeah, people so to make profit out of what we are doing. Yeah. I and think we need a patent reform. I feel like, mm, I think we could find something in between. Yeah. Anyways, okay. How did, we, so, how did this turn into a patent discussion? <laughs> yeah, because I think for the innovation aspect, it's like it's it's a close shot. And also, I don't know. I'm a big fan of the Lens.org as an indexing or literature search tool, and they have a database for patents and scholarly literature, and both cite each other. And I think. We can do more of that on either end, like like entrepreneurs and innovators to cite research literature or find literature that's relevant to their product development. And researchers might want to look and oh, what can this, what I'm um, studying today, um, where is this applicable in the future? And like using keywords to search for patents where you know, your investigations might lead into product development. This can also be a career opportunity for some ERCs, early career re ECRs, early career researchers who might not want to stay in academia. 
not to mention that there's not enough positions for everyone anyways but um, also to and see. if I can just add here so if I mean it helps me to think of it this way right if we had to look at patent laws and patent uh, regulations in the in comparison to mm -hmm. uh open innovation and open science. To me, it seems like this. If they were intersecting Venn diagrams, then the intersection is, it, they do intersect. But the large part of the, the patenting regulations that are not a part of the intersection, I think is where we lose a lot of what can be still openly mm -hmm. innovated. Because like you said, having the documentation allows us to know what is. Mm -hmm. But that knowledge doesn't really translate to much if you cannot... I don't know, develop a new product yeah, based yeah. off this knowledge because it's under IP, right? And it still fits in the open science framework fairly well because it is documented. Mm -hmm. But I think, like I said, if that intersection is doesn't keep growing, I think it would just be not as accelerated and a bit more wasteful. Can mm -hmm. I add to this as well? So, I mean, I agree with what you're saying, but again, the whole point of it is that they, whoever came up with it, will develop it further. And mm -hmm. so other people don't need to come into this. I mean, that's I, I assume that's why people have such long patents is that you can like, because if you take a drug, for example, you have a patent for 20 years, but people keep add, if you add another piece to this drug, like another, you attach another molecule, mm -hmm. chemically speaking, that becomes a new patent and so and so and so. So mm -hmm. you will not know what the base product is up until the patent expires, but they will keep developing this if no. they need to but then but, if, and, if and when the patent expires anyone can then use it sure. and uh keep the event for whatever else so so um maybe we can go back to like does this is just like uh, let's <laughs> agree that, that, yeah, yeah, no, but... yeah, sure. maybe we can close off this um uh, this branch of the conversation with the idea of patents was um, I think also helped um, startups and young companies to establish themselves in the market, but 20 years is way too long. And in some industries like medical research and pharma pharma pharmaceutical industry, it's just not healthy because we we don't need more monopolies or silver from many monopolies or a few. Um, but we need more participation from around the world also to combat something like a pandemic effectively like just didn't work so well for this one and we could have done better if the patents were lifted earlier or at all anyways okay so coming back to so what yeah so where, where do you want to go joyce again to the intersection between open and, oh, yeah. open and science or what was the i actually wanted to start from i want, wanted to start from square one right um because actually a question i get asked a lot uh, is and and I got asked a lot like while establishing oils is what is open innovation like what are we actually talking about oh. here <laughs> um and and oh and also why it's called oils right why is it open innovation in life sciences <laughs> yeah. um and I I think for us in oils at least I think Harini found a really nice definition before about what we think open science is and what or not open open innovation is, and so it's it's really it has nothing. Not it's not patents. It's not like all that all that stuff. It's actually even a higher meaning than that definition than that, right? So it's really looking beyond your own self and your own organization for solutions to problems, mm -hmm. right? Open innovation means you go beyond your comfort zones. You interact with other companies other organizations to essentially source solutions right so it goes against kind of like the silo mentality yeah. where like okay we have to solve everything in-house right and so that, i think that's kind of at least for me and i think also for oils um what we are thinking of when we think of like open innovation and so i think the activities that we kind of built in oils is kind of towards that of how do we bring people together from different backgrounds to open in to openly innovate right how do how what are the forms of this and what works well and what um ex, uh, what, pers what what processes work best for this and that like that reminds me of two and i think at the genesis sorry go ahead i was go just ahead. gonna say if you think about it the 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 
the basics of research itself is to build on existing knowledge. And it's actually not very counterintuitive to what you do in research. You want to build on existing knowledge. Yeah. It's just that then that knowledge is not only within your realm, but from everywhere else. Mm. I'm right. Yeah. yeah, adding to that, what oils is at least trying. I mean, the way I see it, oils, the purpose of oils, let's say, is to just spread this information to everybody else who might make use of it. I feel that open innovation is not something you see at the moment. It's not the the it's not the norm. So a, a small organization like us, at least we can start the conversation, mm -hmm. and then hope that it goes beyond the conversation to actual practice one day. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's all about breaking down barriers, right? In terms of like there's this kind of misconception in academia, like industry is evil, all they care about is money and things like that. <laughs> um, you know, and 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 that that is that's uh that's not right, right? Like that's that's not what they're necessarily doing there. And so we're trying to change people's perceptions of each other to just be like, hey, you know, we should actually be working together and not against each other. There's not this us and them kind of thing. We're just kind of all in this together. Sure. And, and also someone money... who's not been previously introduced into the open open aspect of science, open mm -hmm. innovation in itself can seem like a lot, right? These mm -hmm. it's big words. Mm -hmm. It can mean nothing to people and everything to somebody. And mm -hmm. I think oils at we also try to help people, early career researchers specifically, to kind of find inroads into practicing open science. How can you practice it? What what are what are easy implementable solutions and systems in your day-to-day -day research that you can do that helps you practice open science within your limited capacity, mm -hmm. limited or unlimited capacity um, before in the academic system, right? Because we are at the end of the day, an association that's affiliated with universities. Mm -hmm. So our target, large part of our target audience are early career researchers, meaning PhD students and postdoctoral researchers within the university framework. And it's not something that's practiced every day. I mean, open innovation, now open science is a large discussion, but I think open science earlier would mean open access. But mm -hmm. That's not all that is. That is a large part, a huge part of what open science could be, but that's not all that is. Mm. And I think OILS is trying to kind of bring in different perspectives on what other pillars are there to open science and open innovation right. that they can practice. It's open and, source. And to also like fix this kind of mis... Yeah. So we have a delay. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Just, 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 to add, just to add to Harini's thing, it's, it's also like, I, I think one of the things that at least people in OILS keep repeating to others and when they when they talk about open science is, uh, is exactly what we talked about before about like open does not mean everything is open everything is free yeah. <laughs> um we really uh stand behind this kind of um what is it open as possible closed as necessary mm. right yeah. so yeah that's also the mantra I mean, yeah. we're coming from in the community the mini yeah. No, I mean, you mentioned this earlier, Joe, that um, open is, is it's not such a big, uh, it's not something different. It's basically best practices. How how can you do your work more efficiently? I, I think it's more efficient, at mm -hmm. least in a research setting. To sure. document, to make things a little bit more open, share your protocol, share your data. I mean, you collaborate as well, right, in, in academia. So it's about how to do this in a way that's actually, you know, you, you can... You do it and then somebody else can look at it and then do the same thing and without having any problems or having to call them up and be and mm. ask how did you do this experiment how did you how did you analyze this data mm. so open what we're, what we're basically preaching is open science is basically how to do these things in a bit, bit of an efficient way that you can not waste time doing these things you can efficiently then continue your work or mm. somebody else can continue it yeah. yeah, and and two pillars of open science are also open source software and open source hardware. Um, yeah, and it's also much relevant in the life sciences sector. Um, but so what what are each of your personal opinions? Because or just if I if I start giving mine, like there is 
usually you have two leaks. Those who are full proponents of open source only is the only way to go and it's, um, it's ethical and I, I can totally subscribe to that. But I think there's also a legitimacy to closed source um, where, and this is usually coming from companies who developed a hardware product or so software and needed to protect it um, against competition or bigger um, bigger companies who otherwise would you know just uh, be quicker and more efficient in putting this to market. So they had to make it close to us. I know a few examples of that. But then of course it's better practice to to open it up, like to open the code and the algorithms and um and still being able to make money of it. But like when it comes down to using for researcher choosing a software package, which is open source versus one that is closed source. Sometimes in your discipline or what you need to apply to your research, there is no open source alternative or the ones that are there, you would have to build um, knowledge first to deploy it. Whereas when you buy it from like as closed source from a company, that usually comes with services and maintenance and all of that. So there, it's a give and take. So there's also no easy answer there from my experience. Or how do you see that in, in your real life experiences and from what you've learned through oils? Uh, um, yeah? As a, um, yeah. Oh, I'm trying to think of an example basically where a closed source, let's say hardware. I mean, do you, would you take, I don't know, some kind of lab equipment as a closed source hardware that, you know, you, you is that what you mean? Or, yeah, yeah I mean, I'm just trying to apply. Like, like, well, in my own PhD, like, um, so we had old microscopy still in the institute, and there were also older researchers who still had the old school equipment, and you could basically fix it when some, some part is broken or loose, you could just bring a screwdriver and fix it yourself. Whereas now with the modern microscopes, once one, one button doesn't work, you, you basically have a device that's worth maybe 10,000 euros and you can't use the whole thing just because of one button misbehaving. You have to wait for two weeks to have it serviced by the company. And that may, may or may not be successful. So it builds a whole lot of dependence, not alone um, that we don't know anymore what happens inside the product. So how much of a rigorous research process can it be if the researcher doesn't know what the product does to the data, what you give in and get out? Like it's basically a black box and you have to trust the manufacturer that they've known what they what you want them to, to know to put everything in order to, for you to get the data that you need. And the same with software, like, if the, the code and the algorithm is not known to the research or the research team at large, not that every researcher or biologist doesn't necessarily have to be a data scientist, like I wasn't, but at least that some researcher would be able to interpret the algorithm and make sure that it actually calculates or processes the data to produce uh, data output the way you want. And that makes sense in a you know life science world. But um, we have to trust the manufacturers and the product developers. And it's, if it's open source, in theory, you can see, because it's it's published, you can see the code, you can see the algorithm. And sometimes the algorithm and the code is messy, so that also requires a whole lot of cleaning and, well, documentation, oh, yeah, good documentation and all that. So it's not necessarily better, but it's more transparent for sure. And so where the trade-off comes in, do you trust, would you rather trust a well-documented but not open to you as a practicing researcher product or algorithm, which works? And maybe you can build a relationship with the manufacturers and product developers to, to align to such a degree that they understand what you're trying to achieve and they can assure that that's what the algorithm does. And then you still have to trust them. Or would you rather have a messy code and spend a year of your lifetime and research time budget on yeah cleaning the code and making sure it works for you. I think like both, in other words, both have pros, have pros and cons. 
so I I will chime in here because <laughs> in, in the in the context of like um, building the infrastructure for oils because it is you know there is an mm. environment set up mm. digital environment set up for people to work in um, and I've also done some consulting work in helping organizations build these kind of ecosystems of working in yeah. where we have to choose what kind of software we want to use uh, yeah. and what plot what technology you want to use right um <laughs> okay uh so personally i'd really love to use open source mm. all the time you know support the community um and 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 that all that however we uh, as a as an association and and we as people aren't aren't silos <laughs> we have to as an entity like a, a company or an association you do have to interact with other people right so if you have to interact with other people who are like from places that normally don't use these tools and only use tools that are like the closed um software <laughs> um it's makes your life a lot easier if you also use the same kind of platforms right mm. but um but how you use these tools can make a difference um in mm. in, in in i guess yeah i i think how you use your these tools is 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 um important to the discussion too right so you can use closed tools in an open way mm. right so like Google Drive, for example, right? Like how how do you share that within your organization and with uh, external collaborators, right? I mean, you know, you can you can you can use Google, which is uh, or Google Drive, which is a tool developed by like a, a private company, and it's not open source, mm. um, but you can use it in an open way. Yeah, and it's right. versatile. Everybody, like most people, know it. They know to, how to handle it. It's also just to mention a uh, open source alternative with Nextcloud or OnCloud. Um, so there are alternatives, but then it's it's like I've tried so hard to bring several teams into open source solutions, but and they might be working well. It's just that people don't know them as well. The, it's it's another new digital product you have to wrap your head around, and it's just oftentimes too much to ask people to to do. Um, I, it, exactly. I think Personally speaking, I, I agree with that. I think there are now so many different tools that you can use that people kind of get lost in most of them or people try to have too many of them, which sometimes they do the same thing. Mm. So I, I think it takes a little bit of time to also kind of, let's say for oils to, to have one channel for communication, one channel for organizing things, one a uh, place to organize the one um, yeah place to organize the conference because there's so many things and you have to kind of choose the same mm -hmm. thing and try then and then there are new things coming out as well and better things coming up so where do you put draw the line okay mm -hmm. maybe there's another better open source tool, but hey we're using this at the moment and everything's built around this but do you want to spend more time trying to learn something else to shift there because it's it's more open or mm. it's a little bit better so <clears throat> that i think personally for me this is this is a big thing so if i know how to use something i i tend to stick to that because i think that's the best way to go or for easier way for me to go unless i see like a big benefit of me switching to another system altogether sure. and makes my life a lot easier so personally for me yes uh, and one other thing that you mentioned to do you want to use something and use it your or use a messy code and do this yourself um if you don't have the knowledge to do it something like that then it's difficult mm. uh, then it's like oh you have to learn something else in order to do this in a more open way yeah. i think as people as having other things to do is a bit difficult as well so if there's somebody else you can help you Mm. like even if it's a little bit closed then not the most open way to do things i think i think that's okay mm. um yeah yeah i think it's a trade-off between. Trade if i can people. bring the focus go ahead sorry sorry um yeah no no um so you mentioned open source um 
softwares or code, let's say, in the in the context of oils. Um, so I think they they really highlighted really well our our approach to it with the operations part of it, right? But we also in we work in the intersection of researchers interested in open science. Mm. And if I can speak from my experience as a very 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 limited interaction with computational <laughs> biology and code and any sort of informatics. A lot of the research groups now um, have started making their source, uh, their, their, their research open. And mm -hmm. a lot of groups work on developing packages and codes to analyze a lot of scientific data. And all of this is on GitHub. A lot of this is open already. Now, apart from these open packages, there are companies that provide services in the research in the research sphere, right? And the choice between going with a service or using a service typically then means it's closed mm -hmm. or an open source code like Devmani said would be how much of an expertise, a competence do you already have on your side? How mm -hmm. much can you grapple with an open source code to change it or to understand it and mold it to your requirements to process your data, to answer your research questions? Versus if you do not have somebody who can wrangle with this and you yourself do not have the competence, then it does make sense for resource rich groups, research groups and researchers to use closed source code softwares or, or um, services where they can bring that uh, that expertise. No. It maybe doesn't so much matter if you're using open source code or source closed source code, if at the end you're okay with opening up your research data. Maybe then you kind of compensate for using what, going against what you maybe perceive as um, against your open principles, let's say. If you are able to put your data processed on a public repository, then let's say it cancels each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks for-, for That being said. Oh, oh. I was gonna say that that being said, like we we said, like we we'd like using tools that work, but at least we also don't mind using tools that other people prefer too, right? Because mm -hmm. it, we also learn too. Um, we engage with other open science organizations that use other technologies that are open source, um, and um, we also learn from it too, right? Like this tool exists, you know, mm. and then we know that this tool exists and we can kind of keep it in our, in our database <laughs> of our head our, our, yeah. um, and, and um, essentially pull it out whenever we find a situation where it's appropriate to apply. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. I was also going towards. Um, so first of all, thanks for sharing um, your experiences in, in choosing tools open versus closed source for running the organization or the association as always, but also like um, what what is it i think there's also something we can basically transfer and agree again that it's it's a healthy mix of both makes makes uh yeah makes for the best way forward i guess because it comes down to usability affordability like the price price tag um and the fact that open source is often free it's not free because then you need somebody to service and that at minimum costs you time and time again is money at the end of the day because that eats us on the research budget. If you have a PhD student who spends a year in learning a software to run to, yeah, before even starting the experiments and that actually happens. So um, it comes again down to monetary questions and capacities. And as long as we document well, also for closed systems, which ones and which version have we used in what experiment, we're, we're good. And then um, other people can make their own sense of it. And, and that's when research experiments get replicable. And um, yeah, when, when we have the transparency that we want to achieve in an open science and open innovation sphere. Absolutely, yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> So, so many aspects to consider, but it's, it's really exciting to get to talk with you guys about all of this. Is there some other angle you'd like to, to dive in after we've already touched on so many, but is there something that you would like maybe towards conclusion of this conversation? Uh, yeah, some, something else we, we should address before we part ways for today. Um, maybe I maybe. can just say something that 
a lot of researchers, maybe even your listeners, right? Um, people who haven't had the chance to attend OILS, Mm. I'm just going to plug it in. If you can, come attend <laughs> the conference. It's virtual. <laughs> no, but like for people who haven't had the chance to explore open science or who are interested now, I think it's important. And this is something I've learned a little o uh, over time. It's not come to me right at the beginning. Is It's not an all or a nothing approach. Mm. It's not you... It's like what Joy said. I really like what she said is that we are as open as we can be and as closed as needed, or I'm paraphrasing what she said, but essentially that. Um, because I think a lot of people, when they start out, they're like, oh, you know what? We should make everything open. We should be publishing open access. All our data should be uh, on on some repository. We should have all of our protocols always on demand, accessible to anybody who wants it. Mm -hmm. um, we should be communicating our science via science communication at the same time. Sure, these are ways, if you have the capacity to practice all of it, all at the same time, that's fantastic. But a lot of times you don't. And it's okay to start with, with a focus that is within your capacity, mm. time, funding, availability. Um, and I think this is really something that I also learned over time. And this applies to not just open science, I think even like to a lot of day to day, right? It's not an all or a nothing. It's you mm. can still make substantial contribution towards open science and practice open science by doing small things. Mm. Um, I don't know, maybe somebody out there listening thinks it's an all or nothing and then it, I can let you know it's not. Yeah, it's quite overwhelming. It has so many, so many aspects like in open science that we've already mentioned here and like it just goes on um, like how open can you be and like very and still recognizing and, and making sure sensitive data is protected. So it's not about disclosing each and every part of your research and every step of the game, but to, yeah, like you said, to, to open up in manageable amounts and what feels right for you and especially like when within a team you don't agree how open you should be about the research then the important thing is to come in agreement first and um, then to start with a minimum agreeable approach and first step to take and that's already a great win like you said I agree yeah Joyce yeah I, I, oh, I also mm -hmm. sorry Go Oh, you were gonna say something. No, no, no. Uh, no I was gonna just uh, say that, like, to add to what Harini is saying, like, yeah, it's not all, all or nothing. Also, you don't have to think about open science. As, oh, I'm just, I, it's another concept that I need to think about and and adopt into my daily life. It's it's at the end of the day, it's a bit of a mindset uh, a change and a culture change. It's a little habit that you kind of develop along the way that end up being the norm of how you should be doing things uh, or how you can be doing things a little bit better and I, I think yeah the smallest thing matters if you, if you you don't even need to start practicing at least start to think about it talk with talk amongst each other oh what can I do what what's the tiniest thing I can do to start with mm. and then it kind of snowballs into a bigger bigger thing and before you even know it you don't really need to even give it terms anymore it's it's just uh it's just how you do things mm. I, I think open science is mainly just a change change of habit and change of culture i, I think if we can start a conversation it'll get there mm. i agree Joyce. i really liked dev mini's um comment about it's a mindset because i mean to be honest um that's actually what's followed me through this in my entire like kind of career thus far. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's the mindset. And that's, that's what's really developed in terms of like how I work and how I interact with other people. Um, and I hope that, you know, other people can also kind of have this open science mindset of, you know, collaboration and sharing um, and transparency. Um, and this is also, yeah. So anyways, um, this has followed me all the way through. And I think this is like kind of what I take away from open science um, from my journey, at least. Yeah, I just want to hook up on that because we wonder, or I just wonder it because this is what oftentimes the conversation comes down to. And why is it so difficult? Is it because openness is also vulnerability as we, we have, like when we're open about our research, we also disclose 
flaws or what you know are commonly referred to as flaws, but are just processes. And data is messy. It's not perfect. It, it's not meant to be perfect, but I think also, again, in our mindsets, we want to work towards perfection, which we'll never reach because we're always at the brink of knowledge. So um, it's a little bit of a dilemma in a way, but also, yeah, that's, that's a, yeah, maybe this is also the fear. It comes with a lot of fears not to be, not to be an open or not to practice open science in our research environment. Maybe also because in the past or still today, it's not common to be so transparent as it's now being called upon for by the open science community or different open science practices and principles. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you want to add to that, but so maybe yeah, if I may, yeah, um, please. I think. I think your observation of it being a, a fear to open up is very valid, but it's valid in well-resourced settings. Sometimes the barrier to open is not the mindset, but also the resources, because it's argue inarguably expensive sometimes to be open, right? Open access publishing is very expensive. So I think the fear to being open is very justified in resource high resource settings, but in other settings, I think it's enabling providing the resources for research groups and for institutes and organizations to have an open framework and have an open system um, mm. that's not just limited by the fear of opening up. Yeah, I just want to add like the idea or the perception that open access is meant to be expensive or turned out to be expensive nowadays only applies to yes, many journals, but only of very few publishers. So there's still plenty of journals out there which um, is free to publish in or affordable to publish in because they charge the actual costs that are being course, acquired yes. as they publish. So that's also a pass by, but it's not what most people, most researchers see. Like, so the, so what the point you're making is still valid. And that's, I think comes down to my job and that of my colleagues to inform about walkable paths and alternatives that we can embrace as researchers to to practice open science in a meaningful and an affordable way to be globally inclusive, not to be limited by our capacity of research um, equipment or funding available and working towards, yeah, equalizing that across the globe. But that's, yeah, that's a process also that's included. Maybe I can add just a little bit, one more thing, I think it's for people, no, because, uh, um, there's also this need to create incentive, I feel. Because mm. somebody is not a fan of open or they're not a fan of open science, they have one thing in mind. I need to publish high, I need to get the best post up, I need to be the best professor. They will not care so much about pub, you know, their mindset is in a different place. They don't mm. care about the open policy or open science. So how do you create incentive for people like that or people to to want to practice open yeah. science. I think this is some, I don't have the answer, but uh, this is something I think a lot of people, we can also think about um, to make sure that this mindset yeah. is uh, shared. And Luckily, we already have an episode on that topic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. I think that was probably a good uh, closing statement. So if I may just quickly refer to us, so we had, an episode about Quara, the Coalition of Research Assessment Reform, no, Research Reform of, anyway, so it's it's a continuation from as of Dora, the Declaration on Research Assessment, San Francisco um, initiated, so there was a conference in San Francisco at a time where the, um, the participants of that conference, or some of them came together to postulate a declaration of oh, let's reform research assessment and not by matrices where we just count the journal articles, but applying qualitative measures and that's where things get complicated. <laughs> so the answer is still not easy and simple and there's no one size fits all, but a lot of people are working really hard to find better better assessments and incentives for researchers to 
to do better research and well to do continue great research as we are always wanting to do but not being pressured by having to publish as quick um, as possible and as often as possible um yeah and and i think like all of us are in charge now like the listeners as here you're doing your part with audience thanks for that so to enable such discussions to have uh, in real life on site as well as in the digital spaces um and we need more of that and yeah and there will be well there's there's a growing number of um that's maybe one last question i have so how far has oil spread as in have you triggered other regional organizations to initiate similar um, initiatives or funding organizations like oils or have you widened the scope beyond zurich now or across switzerland or beyond so i think we like yeah what's uh, for the closing statement from each where do you see oils in the next five years and where we're we already at as in terms of growth outside the I'm going to field this one to Harini and Dick Mead because they're essentially the future of oils. I'm like old oils. <laughs> um, well, and they're the next yeah. generation. <laughs> right. So on that, yes, I think uh, since I've joined, I from knowing just oils, I've kind of started to see a lot more open um, science in um uh, opportunities and forces and, and organizations pop up within Switzerland. Mm -hmm. I'll just talk about Switzerland for now um, because we didn't know so much if it, at, at least I didn't know so much that um, th if there are any other initiatives in and around Zurich at least even at the um, university level that, mm -hmm. um, the same thing as us was doing similar things and yes there, there is and even this year, I think there's quite a few things coming up, people organizing courses. Last year, I think you were there as well at the Open Science Summer School. Uh, yeah. As yeah. Well as so I, I was there, I was like, oh, wow. And they talked about us as well. Oils is an organization doing mm -hmm. similar things. Like, oh, wow, there, there, is a, there is now a network. And we've tried to reach out to the French part in the past. Um, didn't quite... Uh, work out at that time but now I've actually heard from one of the one of the association members there is a she knows somebody who from EPFL who's organizing a summer school there so mm -hmm. yes there, there are quite a few things popping up in in Switzerland at least in the French part and in the German part as mm -hmm. far as I know yeah nice Harry. And I think in keeping with the spirit of open science and collaboration um, for oils in itself, maybe the idea is not to say we want an oils in every city, but <laughs> it is to say <laughs> it is to say we want to be able to work with communities across um, Switzerland, but also across the world. And I think we're able to do this already to us. To a fair degree with our uh, conference, because of its virtual nature, we have a lot of participants from across um, the globe. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of how how do we want to grow in number or in reach, I think it's with involving more people um, from across the globe in this conversation. At the moment, we do have a lot of participation from what we could say are resource rich privileged communities it would be nice to also have participation outside these regions um we also are trying to come up with more events mm -hmm. that focus on actual enabling actual open innovation participation instead of as just a conference where you learn about it um so we have also a hackathon coming up where people can participate and actually innovate themselves so we really try to push the open innovation aspect through this mm -hmm. but i think the conference would be um definitely something that happens every year and we hope that more people can from across the globe participate mm. and, and the website oils, is, sorry go ahead sorry as for oils in the future we just hope that you know after we live that there's people that will keep continuing what we are doing um into the next five years hopefully or even more so the mm. idea i think as as i i don't it would be nice if it grew bigger but I think it will also be fine if this kept going as it is as a mm -hmm. constant um constant thing instead of it being uh it's yeah instead of it stopping at some point yeah 
But the thing is, is like, you know, we've already made an impact because we have alumni, right? Yeah. <laughs> and people who pass through oils and maybe they don't stay with the organization forever, but um, we go off and go work at companies. We go off to work in the government. We go off and work in research fields and academia. Mm -hmm. And we have all been affected um, and learned something about open science going through oils, right? So maybe we didn't know about open science when we started oils, um, but and we we all just really wanted to learn how to organize an event. But in the mm -hmm. end, the impact is that, you know, in organizing this event, we all learn something about open working documentation, reproducibility mm -hmm. and things like that. And we bring this into our future lives. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Yeah. And for sure, anyone who attends in the future or has attended in the past, um, as an attendee and um, participant, it has taken something with it for their own career and being inspired and um, yeah, just um, being exposed to the magnitude and the benefits that open science brings to society and the research community. And yeah, so we, it's a constant learning and a, and a very supportive ecosystem and, and community or several communities coming together. And I think also, like you said, like that you keep a focus on Switzerland or Zurich as like the, the home base for oils makes a lot of sense because you can still go global while keeping the conversations also at the local level and, and both like without um, having to build this huge um, uh, overarching organization which is also an option and some communities have taken that route and anything is is viable but, yeah and I think the model that you're now um, uh, building with oils in Zurich is also beautiful and and relatable and and has its like you know measurable impact as in or sometimes hard to measure to all the details but um as a oh, you you can as we said like you can see the impact it has on certain people and and the community in the region as well as um, engagement with the global community as well so so it has its its benefits and its networking effects yeah I, I think what Joyce mentioned that people who go through this take something with them and maybe the impact we see it in I don't know 10, 10 years when these yeah. people are at the top trying to do something right. uh, trying to change something trying to do something better so yeah and i think at some point it's, i think it's also only after like now where where you are with us like five years in the like the alumni might also come back as speakers they might share to the now present community what their route was how they started once as a as an organizational team member in oils and what where that has taken them with their careers and that can then feed also back into the organization. Yes. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Like, I feel like I've already learned so much again. And there's so many question marks uh, in the process. And that's part of the process. As we are researchers, we know that not, not everything is like should be known to each of us. But we are here to all, always explore the or push the boundaries of knowledge. And we've done quite a fair bit of that today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. It was a great experience. Mm -hmm.